You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Road. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Every deck tells a story and every piece of tech holds a lesson. Today we take a look at 10 new deck lists from Modern and Pioneer and plumb their secrets for 10 lessons to level up your deck building technique. That's all coming up on this edition of Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson. I am coming to you from the Twin Cities, and I am joined by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is Caved In Online, Daniel Schriever. Dan, what's going on, man? It's been a while. Hey, doing well, David. Feeling rested. Just got back from vacation. I was out in California visiting my sister and my niece. Yeah, lots of travel on the 4th of July. I was also uh, up north, which is a very common thing for Twin Cityans to find their cabin on a lake somewhere uh, you know we don't have the ocean <laughs> so we <laughs> we have much colder bodies of water <laughs> to uh you know drink our yellow beer and uh, drive our <laughs> pontoons or canoes or whatever on so yeah everyone who lives in minnesota either has a cabin up at the lake or knows someone a friend or a neighbor yeah, exactly. who periodically invites you to some of the cabins are in wisconsin which is a little bit problematic but We'll allow it. Yeah. And you can always go to the North Shore, right? That's everybody's lake. <laughs> it sucks to swim in, but it is a, you know. I read a whole piece. There's all these San Franciscans that are now, like, in love with Duluth. What? It's like, oh, it's, you know, it's got very similar temperature in the, the summer to Duluth. And, you know, it's old time. People haven't been to Duluth. It's this uh, very picturesque city on the North Shore. I'm just like, man, these San Franciscans are in for a fucking <laughs> world of pain. <laughs> January 10th, it's like 14 inches of snow again. <laughs> How the hell do these people live up here? <laughs> I was wondering why these houses were 50 times cheaper than a one-bedroom studio in San Francisco. <laughs> Wait, they're saying that the, the climate in Duluth is similar to the climate in the Bay Area? Like breeze coming off the lake? Well, because they roll, you know, like the, the whatever, there, there is a narrative online, especially among certain types of conservatives, that like California is a shithole and crime's out of control and we need to, you know, move to Texas or whatever. So... A lot of the quote unquote enlightened people is like, okay, still a blue state, Minnesota. And so all these tech guys moved like out in the spring to Duluth and have just been like trumpeting it. So I like even my friends that live in Duluth, it's like you just meet all these like tech bros. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, Asian Americans that work in the industry. So like it's super cool yeah, to see a little bit God. more diversity. Duluth is a pretty white city. So you can imagine northern Minnesota. It's like, yeah, it's really cool. It's like, man, these guys are just going to get absolutely <laughs> rinsed. <laughs> Uh, with the giant lake effect, Duluth just gets so much more snow even than the Twin Cities. It doesn't get quite as cold, but man, it is a miserable place to be. <laughs> it's super hilly, so people get in car accidents all the time. I just imagine this, you know, like tech bro, he's wearing his like slides and his t-shirt all the time. He's like, what the hell's going on? My little <laughs> two-door front-wheel drive car literally can't function <laughs> after Thanksgiving up here. <laughs> wow. I did not know that story. We should be making a documentary about that. Is <laughs> <laughs> the you know co-owner of uh, Uber or whatever, <laughs> Shutterfly or whatever, and just <laughs> yeah. So no MU today. He's been hard at work. I have him locked in a basement in Buenos Aires, just recording podcasts while we've been away. But uh, <laughs> he was on last week. Yeah, with a couple of great guests, we had Davius Minimus, the creator of the Temeshi Bloom combo deck, and other sweet brews as well. You may have heard of like Enigmatic Incarnation in Modern, and one of our own, Soren Wellman, aka First Turn Negator, came and told us all about Mausoleum Secrets. I definitely recommend those episodes if you've not checked them out yet. Uh, they're just fantastic to listen to. And I gotta say, it's it's nice to just kick back and hear such passionate brewers sharing their craft. Yeah, like you don't have to see how the sausage is made. You just get to 
hear you know someone who knows a, a super deep knowledge and they just kind of very eloquently explain all the things that they thought about and the struggles that they had to do instead of us having to like boot up a league you know get the shit kicked out of us a couple times tweak a bunch of cars get the brew ready for the thing debate about it it's like oh man this is so much nicer <laughs> yeah yeah i mean sorian's been working on mausoleum secrets like a madman for like a few weeks now and i mean his notes on it are just there's like a PhD thesis here on <laughs> Mausoleum Seekers. We got some of them in the show outline, which patrons get access to, but we're going to be putting some of that onto faithlessbrewing.com as well so that uh, everyone can benefit from the secrets of the mausoleum. All right. I have. Uh, th- I don't know how we do this, if we, if we like register a bet you know, on some of those other ones. But in our lifetime, so I'm going to say by 2050, there will actually be <laughs> a PhD. <laughs> PhD. Okay, what you? Yeah. I'll be dead by then, but you'll still <laughs> yeah. be alive. Uh, there'll be a PhD that someone can get just from game theory by designing like a super sweet magic deck. Like if you break a format, you will be able to get a PhD from some kind of online internet, but accredited university. Like if you design whatever the super sweet tech is, that person will get a game theory PhD that, that will exist. Or if someone like invents whatever Star Trek six, the best Zerg rush and they like, optimize for that their description their notes the equivalent of what uh debbie's minimus and, and the other uh, people pr- provided assuming that became a successful strategy that will allow you to get some type of accredited degree i'm predicting and in, in by the time 2050 rolls around accredited so not like faith is brewing university and not just like me you know sending you uh, you know <laughs> okay. a cake that says congratulations you know <laughs> I mean, like, will Telerian Community College ever become a degree-granting institution? I, I don't Something know. functionally equivalent to that is going to happen. Now, this is my bet. I would, I would open the betting up to anybody in the Discord or anyone out there. Um, I'm pretty confident that that will exist. So you're, you're bullish on esports. Okay, yes, I'll, exactly. I'll take that bet. Sure. This, this, is, this is also like a bet against like the collapse of academia as an institution uh, and the rise of sort of the YouTube uh educated people you know commenting on vaccine health or whatever it's it's all those things plus sort of the gamification of sports Mm. in general you know when you see people like oh baseball is like miserable to watch now because we figured out you should just like never swing you know it's like well this is terrible (laughs) (laughs) what the hell (laughs) yeah anyway just put it out there if anybody if anybody wants a little action i will bet a (laughs) hundred dollars against anybody else and in 2050 i will be coming to collect (laughs) Or my, you know, <laughs> yeah, or your estate, Katie will, <laughs> Katie will on my behalf for right. her retirement. Okay, well, if you want to get in on that action, um, obviously the best way to do so is by joining the Faithless family. Got to join the Discord. <laughs> joining our Discord, you can find that at Patreon.com/slash/FaithlessBrewing. You can make a pledge; can be as little as a dollar a week, and who knows? I mean, that could repay you a hundredfold if you <laughs> make good on this bet with David. Um, you also get access to some bonus content. We have our show outlines, all our research notes, all that is available to the patrons as well. If you're interested in more physical, tangible bling, we have merch, we got tokens, we got stickers, we even got some playmats. If you're hitting up the, what do they call it now? Regional RCQ? RCQs, RCQ, whatever circuit, that yeah. stands for. Yeah. <laughs> Regional challenge. I don't know. Qualifier. If you want to go represent for the Faithless Family in style. You can find all that in the Patreon as well. And we do, you can play a stock list even if you have a Faithless Brewing merch. So you, you, you don't have to bring a brew just because you're bringing some sweet Faithless Brewing stuff. Yeah. You can still just, you can just leave up stock, blue, red, you know, <laughs> Merc Tide. That's okay. You might pick up a half percentage point in equity because the opponent will see you unroll the gorgeous Faithless Brewing map. Yeah, it's like this guy's got to be doing some kind of... <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Change one card of the 75, and then now it's a brew. It's like, oh, I'm playing in a braid in the sideboard. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> this guy's a madman. A couple other things. We do have two new patrons we would like to welcome this week. They are Evan R. and Killinator. Thank you very much for joining the Faithless family. And a little update on our monthly project. So Project Ginny Faye is drawing to a close. We've got the crew at Serum Visions hard at work on their token decks. That's Brian Madden and Arun Singh, aka Jiggy Wiggy, aka Dr. Combo. They'll be joining us next week uh, to share their findings 
on what we've learned about token decks during this month, and we have a whole new slate of cards to vote on for the next project. If you want to vote on those cards, you can do that by joining the Discord, and if you actually want to nominate a card to have it be a card that is on the ballot, which a lot of these cards, we've been featuring them throughout the month, um, these are, again, suggestions uh, from people in our Discord, so there's still time. I believe this episode will come out on Friday, and you'll have until tomorrow night, Saturday, depending on when you listen to the show, to put a card on the ballot. Yeah, it's really fun to see cards that people nominate and their reasons for wanting to nominate them. And then it's fun to kind of like noodle over like, all right, this card wins. Like, what what, what can we do with it? <laughs> what cards don't we want to win? Because <laughs> we're not 100% sure what to do with them. So... Yeah, really fun part of the year and uh, super fun working with the the guys uh, at Serum Visions. I mean, they just have super cool ideas and they, they take stuff in, in directions, you know, we never would have thought of. Exactly. All right, David. So what is on the docket for today? Well, we're going to do a little overview. Uh, I think you have it aptly named 10 decks, 10 lessons, some cool technology in Pioneer and Modern. This is kind of the slow season after an avalanche of sets. It felt like from sort of the beginning of COVID on, we are in our first, I don't want to say fallow period, because I feel like this should be almost the normal, but you know, the summer is a time to go (laughs) travel to your lake or whatever. It's not a time to be purchasing sets, but this will be the longest time between two sets in a very long time, especially sets that affect the two formats that we're interested in. So, but there is still some innovation happening in both formats as people keep trying out different stuff. Uh, especially Pioneer, I feel like, you know, this is a place for brewers. The, yes, most people play stock lists, and it is frustrating. Like when I'm in leagues, I'm just playing the same decks over and over again. But there are people having success all the time, um, you know, abandoning some some quote-unquote cards that must be played in these archetypes or building new archetypes. So I think you've highlighted a bunch of cool technology here. The numbers have been great in Pioneer lately. We're seeing 40-plus decks in every 5-0 deck dump, uh, which is fantastic. Although actually in this list of 10 decks, um, actually seven of them are from Modern, three are from Pioneer. So actually some good good innovation happening in Modern recently as well. But again, 10 decks, 10 lessons, we're trying to draw conclusions that are applicable to brewing writ large. So whatever format you're into, whether that's Modern, whether that's Pioneer, maybe you're into Explorer. Like it's, that's not my business. If that's your kink, that's cool too. Um, <laughs> So we're going to try to distill like little little nuggets of value that can help you out no matter what you're playing. Yeah, absolutely. So shall we start at the first deck? All right. First deck up is from Pioneer. Uh, I'm calling it Blood Tithe Niv Mizzet. It's five color Niv, right? Five color Niv moves between tier one and tier two in Pioneer, depending on the metagame. But this deck is a little bit different, right, David? When I look at this list, the first thing I notice is there's no Sylvan Curiated. Yeah. Um, at various points in Pioneer's history, I have jokingly, but in the classic, like, all jokes are said, be- are funny because they're true, uh, that Sylvan Carry Added is the best card in the format. It is certainly not the best card in the format now. Um, blocking is actually very, very bad. It's never been worse. Uh, Sylvan Carry Added is not good against the uh, good aggressive decks right now and it isn't uh, obviously particularly good against control decks and it's not, I mean... It doesn't block anything in uh, like black red mid range. It doesn't do anything. It's it's just the best rampant growth. And in theory, it fixes your mana. But this list, I think, is leaning on Fable of the Mirror Breaker as almost it's like ramp spell to cast Nib Mizzet on time, which is really interesting. I'd never considered that before. Yeah, exactly. So, what are the lessons to draw from this swap? Well, the first lesson is there's no sacred cows, right? If you might be thinking, if I'm playing five color Niv, I gotta play Sylvan Curative. Those are all my best hands. We'll have that accelerator and fixer on turn two. That might just not be true anymore. Now we have as many triumphs as you could possibly want to make your colors of mana. And if, as David's saying, the O3 aspect of the Curative uh, is not good for blocking it. It becomes a liability when you want to play cards like Deafening Clarion and Extinction Event, as this deck is doing. Then, yeah, maybe you just don't want the carry at all. Instead, we see four copies of Fable of the Mirror Breaker, three copies of Blood Tithe Harvester, and that pairing, Blood Tithe and Fable, I mean, it's so strong. It's basically carrying the Rakdos midrange deck on its back. I mean, these cards are just generically good. So... A second lesson is that, you know, don't be afraid to just put these generically good cards into different 
shells where even they, they might not feel intuitive, but I mean, these cars perform and we've seen that now and blood tithe is even a Niv Mizzet hit. Yeah. I mean, I don't love all the choices in this list, but I love adding the blood tithe harvester and fable, the mirror breaker adding fable actually makes me want to also play the four carry addeds again, because the only reason I don't like them, right. Is it leads to flood. You're playing all these lands plus you're playing carry addeds. But Fable helps you, like, unflood by turning extra carry addeds in the late game into other mm. stuff. So, yeah, like, th this list is also playing a bunch of other non-stock cards. Two Kroxa, so it kind of mashes together exactly, I think you highlighted, Dan. Two Dreadbore. It, it's, it, it mashes together chunks of the existing mid-range, the only mid-range deck in the entire format, which is Red-Black. With Niv-Mizzet, which is best matchup, is just Red-Black, right? niv is only really good against... <laughs> the other mid-range deck because it goes over the top of it and it struggles against decks where it requires more efficient removal or counterspell decks so this imports fatal push which is a card that's typically sideboarded in niv and, but now this is main decking it and it's main decking for thoughtsies so in theory it's also much better against control right if you just thoughtsies a counterspell and get one uh bring to light to resolve you're probably going to be control just because you're going to outvalue them so i, I like this idea i, I feel like you can It'd be interesting to play around with some of these concepts and and see how much of it you can preserve by but still keep maybe some of the other things that made Niv Mizzet classic, for lack of a better word. <laughs> uh so so sweet. Because to your point, like, yeah, okay, we don't want to play Karyatic because it dies to sweepers. Well, we're playing Blood Tithe Harvester, which also dies to the same sweepers, right? It dies to the same extinction event on Even and it dies to Deafening Clarion, so. This is very much a black base Niv Mizzet deck. It's actually really shocking to see. How many of the cards are black? Thoughtseize, Push, Croxa, Blood Tithe Harvester, Valky on turn two, Dread Boar, Abrupt Decay. Almost like you took the red black deck and just tried to make it as big as you could. And at that point, why not go five color for the Bring to Light Niv Mizzet top end? But yeah, I mean, I think the, the nugget there is that you have to play to your strengths, right? And if Thoughtseize, Push are attrition cards, they're, they're meant to defang the opponent, create a low resource game, and then just to survive until you. you win with stronger cards. Niv as a tap out control deck just fits into that bill. So it actually does make sense to me to try to incorporate that black package at the bottom of the Niv mana curve. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You know, the the mana bases on these decks are so complicated. I won't uh, fathom a guess as to if it's built correctly or incorrectly. Typically people who are Niv Mizzet players, and uh, I'm going to assume that uh, CFT SOC3 is no exception. They spend a lot of time, you know, agonizing over one extra triome versus whatever. So I think if nothing else, if you want to start with a black base Niv Mizzet list, I think you should just start with this mana base as well. I'm, I, it looks very well tuned to me again, but just from my sort of first glance. Speaking of mana bases, that brings us to our second deck and our second lesson. So our second deck is a Gruul mid-range deck played by Sinistar619. Four Lanor Elves, four Elvish Mystic, and we're looking to go from one drop into three drop into powerful five drop. So on three, you have Bone Crusher, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, a couple Dome Rianica Bolas, because they really want to accelerate to five, and then a selection of five drops, Glory Bringer, Elder Gargaroth. Uh, there's actually four Rekindling Phoenix, which is a little bit strange. But I'm a little bit less interested in the specific choices of what do you play on three, what do you play on five. The thing that really stands out to me about this list is if you look at the mana base, there's four mana confluence in a straight red-green deck. And that is both shocking, offensive, and actually probably mathematically correct. I hate to say it, but <laughs> trying to make red-green ramp-style decks like this work in Pioneer for the longest time, and we've been saying this for, for how long, David? Like, you can't do this without the Fastlands. It's so sad. Yeah, it's, it's really frustrating. The Pathways, of course, very powerful. They are one of the reasons why we all of a sudden started seeing these red-green decks. Like, yeah, your threat package can change. You can play Phoenix or not. You can play Kiora or not, right? We've seen some of these lists play Embercleave. We've seen some of these lists play... I mean, we've, we've picked a lot of different red and green cards that cost three mana, some of which have four power. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is all the way in, and I think the main thing is I want to play two Den of the Bugbear because that card is so powerful. And as soon as you play two cards that are not mountains, so they aren't triggering, you know, red green uh, check lands or the red green really bad uh, check your hand lands, 
as soon as you do that and you still want your green sources to add up, I think you're exactly right. You have to go for mana confluence. And in theory, this deck is killing them so fast. The life loss is hopefully not going to matter. <laughs> um, game one, you're probably really only the, the or excuse me, your opponents, only the beatdown if they're specifically mono red or the white red heroic deck. So maybe the, the life really doesn't matter. I mean, of course, it'll always matter, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I believe that in order to play Elvish Mystic Land War Elves, you want 17 untapped green sources. Untapped. So that means that no amount of ripbound crags or whatever the slow land is, that those are just not going to count towards that total. Yep. You can play your four pathways, your four stomping grounds. Where are the other nine green sources going to come from? So there's five forests here, one Boseju, and then that's still not enough. You need something else. And if you're going to go game trail, that means you can't play specialty lands like Den of the Bugbear because you're not going to have enough forests and mountains. Um, and that just leaves you with Mana Confluence, which Sinistar 619, I mean, they, they're paying the price and they were rewarded. They, they got top 32 in the weekend challenge. Yeah, and I think accommodating Bugbear is so important. That it, I think it is the best land in the entire format. I think it's even better than Nykthos. Wow. Uh, so if you have a chance to play it, I think you should, and especially in a deck like this where their life total matters. And if, you're, if your assessment of the threat package is that I want to be playing Chandra and Rekindling Phoenix, so those are double red cards on four mana, then you need the extra red sources. So the mana confluence is, is awesome. This is the kind of deck that just like sneakily gets way better when they print the red green fast lands or a renamed version of them if they absolutely, you know, must have the original names be associated with Mirrodin for some bullshit reason. <laughs> It's just like, oh man, is this, you know, there'll be some random like three drop that this deck will have from the new set. And we're like, is that why? It's like, no, no, no. It's just not taking like five extra damage every match from their freaking mana base for no reason. <laughs> so the lesson here is do the math on the mana base. And I think if I look at the sideboard, you almost see that same principle applying here. So the sideboard has three four ofs, four Alpine Moon, four Shifting Ceratops, four Storm Breath Dragon. Why four of those? Like, are those cards that good? Well, not necessarily, but I suspect the reasoning here is like, okay, I, I know my matchup spread. I know I'm hopeless against Lotus Field combo, for example. So if I just want to have a chance, do I actually give myself a chance by playing one Damping Sphere and hoping that I draw it? Like, no, I just pick a card that is actually gives me my best shot, Alpine Moon, according to this player, and just play four of them. And just accept that if I want to try to win this matchup, I should at least mathematically try to do it and just play all four copies. Same thing, Storm Breath against Blue White. Blue White is very powerful right now. Like, you just need to resolve that. So, bringing in four Ceratops, four Storm Breath just gives you the maximum chance to, like, target specific matchups and, you know, have some confidence that you might draw these cards. Yeah, and even main deck, four Lava Coil is not um, a card you see that common, but they've determined the card, the only card that can beat me out of Phoenix is Thing in the Ice. I have to be able to kill Thing in the Ice. Four Lava Coil, one Chandra, and Domri can fight. So, in theory, a deck that does not have that much removal has seven ways to kill a really problematic creature. That's really impressive. Plus four Glorybringer if you, so, you know, are way ahead of them. Yeah. All right, so we're going to shift over to Modern now, where we're seeing some really interesting brews that also give us some interesting lessons. So, David, tell us about this next deck here, this Esper Gorio's list. Yeah, Esper Gorio Through the Breach. But there's no breach. Yeah, I think that's just the NPC Goldfish naming algorithm got a little excited or confused. <laughs> <laughs> they saw a Gristle Brand, they saw a Gorio's Vengeance, and they <laughs> got ahead of themselves. Yeah, so this goes all the way back to, um, I mean, are we, like 2017? When, when was this? <laughs> Jace Friends oh Prodigy, uh, Gorio's Vengeance, Gristle Brand, Obsidot, right? Like, that's the, the basic interaction that's happening here exactly so the idea being that gorio's vengeance returns a legendary creature from your graveyard to the battlefield with haste then you have to sacrifice it on your end step or exile it, is it sacrifice it, or is it's, exile? it's exile exile so this deck gets around in a, a variety of ways one obzadot has always been somewhat of interest especially when aggro is very good because the life gain matters and it is quite a fast clock it also avoids sweepers uh, but Obzidot's natural ability to exile itself during your end step means that it does not exile itself to Gorio's Vengeance, assuming you stack your triggers correctly. So it comes back the next turn 
Uh, it's also like castable. So the, the thought always has been, right, your opponent on the, in game two and three sells out for all this graveyard hate. You can just get to five mana if your opponent, you know, had to mull to their rest in peace and just cast this five mana card, which dodges lots of removal, uh, especially red removal. Um, well, before certain cards are printed. And your uh, Jace Friends Prodigy can tap itself. And if you have five cards in your graveyard, it can become a Planeswalker. So you have all these ways to make your, your of course, nut draw is like Goryeo's Vengeance, Gristle Brand. Um, you draw your cards, do seven to your opponent, maybe draw 14 cards and go all in. The cool thing that the new technology allows you to do is Grief and Solitude are free ways to either protect your combo the turn you go off, ways to turn all the extra cards you turn from Goryeo's Vengeance. You don't end up discarding them, right? You just like, grief out a bunch of thought teases you don't want to cast anymore if you've tapped out so you don't lose any cards of hand size um they get to play faithful mending and then it gets to play prismatic ending as a removal spell but it also is a way to destroy uh hate cards right that your opponent brings in yeah exactly it's a well-rounded list the innovation i think is identifying the you actually can play four copies of gristlebrand now back in 20 15 or whatever year that was <laughs> when we still thought this deck might be like on power level with modern people eventually found that gristle brand is like a little bit swinging for the fences too much right and you saw it drop down from like three copies to two copies to like one copy and then finally it got cut from the list entirely because for all the work it takes to set up a Gorio's Avengers reanimation like one hit with gristle brand didn't win the game because you know you could, you could maybe draw 14 cards off it and deal seven damage but if that didn't win you might just lose the next turn you'd be tapped out right that's all changed i think with grief and solitude exactly like david's saying now if you gorio's a gristle brand even if they try to kill the gristle brand like if they have a solitude you're still going to draw 14 cards you're going to draw some griefs there some solitudes and you can immediately use those cards to completely like defang the opponent so the player titusen Identifying this went all the way up to four copies of Crystal Brand, which I have not seen this in an Espergorio's lists, I don't think ever. And they got rewarded for that. And even like the Ephemerate technology, yes, Ephemerate is great with Grief and Solitude, but it's also not the end of the world. You play your Crystal Brand, you go to attack, your opponent tries to kill it, right? Because the seven life is going to let you draw seven cards. You just Ephemerate in response. Now it no longer is affected by the Gorya's Vengeance EOT trigger. Uh, you just have this 7-7 seven, seven flying lifeline creature in play. They have to kill it next turn again. So, yeah, all the pieces really synergize more than you'd think, right? You you can just win games without doing your thing. You can just do the grief, ephemerate turn one, right, against some decks, disrupt them, get a three-power creature in play. They have to respond to that while you're just doing your normal thing, chewing through your deck with uh, Faithful Mending and Tainted Indulgence, etc. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. So the lesson here is revisit old conclusions. If you felt like, okay, we know about Espergorios that the Gristle brand is not worth it. That might have changed. I mean, many years have passed. Free spells are in vogue right now. Even things that we thought we learned, like, oh, it's a lot of work to like, set up the graveyard. You have to play bad discard spells. That's, that's less and less true. Faithful Mending and four copies of Tainted Indulgence, that's just a good card. I mean, you see that in just like straight up Demir Shadow decks now. Is like That's their expressive iteration equivalent. The tools are changing, and that means that things that seemed, you know, a little bit too fragile or a little bit too much work in the past might be good again now. And I was going to say, Tainted Indulgence is spectacular in this deck. With Solitude and Grief, you have very efficient ways that are uh, positive to the board, right? Solitude actually keeps you alive. That's a five-mana card all of a sudden in your graveyard. Grief is in your graveyard. That's a four-mana card. A land goes to the graveyard. You cast Thoughtseize. All of a sudden, your Tainted Indulgence is just two-mana instant speed draw to if you want it to be. You know, so in, in these post-board games where lots of resources are being traded, all of a sudden, you just have two-mana instant speed draw to at the end of turns. It's, it's a, that's a crazy card. Yeah. There's also four copies of Priest of Thelorites. I don't know if we mentioned that, but that was also just not available for the many years that people were playing Goryeo's Breach. So there's like a lot of ways to get back either Gristlebrand for like the big win or just you know, get back a Grief. We've seen that be very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. All right, deck number four is Song of Creation Combo. Yeah, so Song of Creation is a card we've tooled around with a lot. It's very, very powerful. One of the many super powerful cards from Akoria that almost got pushed to the back because the uh, companion mechanic <laughs> was <laughs> more powerful. But this card has a lot of text on it. And... 
it really encourages you, right? It, it has a high reward. It has a high risk factor. If you don't succeed, we've even in our YouTube show for Wizards of the Coast, we had some great shots of Damien <laughs> fizzling out <laughs> and discarding his, you know, 27 card hand and not winning the game. Uh, but people have revisited this, I think, because the technology is here, right? Um, there, there was always this lurking power. And so how do we turn into a win? I think once people start to invest themselves in it, maybe with a dearth of new cards, it kind of encourages you to go back and revisit some, some old technology. And I think people have started to kind of crack the code of how song creation can be uh, turned into a, a sort of the, the combo. Yeah, and that's the lesson that I want to stress about this build is keep iterating, keep improving, because song of creation seems to get better and better every time we see it. And we do like to check in on this card every time there's like a great leap forward in technology. I feel like one of the big leaps from a couple of months back was realizing that endurance allows you to get around this what if I deck myself problem while being a free spell for your song of creation and encouraging you to play summoner's pact, which is another free spell for song of creation. Um, so that Summoner's Pact Endurance engine was was a huge step in the right direction. Then with Streets of Nukapena, we got an offer you can't refuse. That is a negate for one blue mana, but the person whose spell got countered gets two treasures. You can use that on your own spells, your own free spells even, to turn offer you can't refuse into like a mini ritual effect, which again just solves a, a huge problem that Song of Creation used to have. Like if you tap out for Song... Do you just pass the turn there, or do you actually try to win during that turn, the same turn you resolve the song? And between the free spell engine of Summoner's Pact, Endurance, Offer You Can't Refuse, and now they're playing four Pact Mitigation as well, which protects the combo while also feeding into that free spell angle, you're solving the mana issue as well. You no longer run out of mana. You can actually kill them the same turn you resolve the song. And fizzling is extremely rare. So I think the last piece of the puzzle, and this is what Canister and others have been working on the last couple of weeks, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot of people picking up this deck, is, okay, now we've got all of the engine in place, we just have to find our namesake card, how do we do that? And we saw Canister, you know, playing Sterling Grove or some other, I forgot what other weird cards he was playing. Um, it seems like Glittering Wish is the answer that people have settled on. So this build here from Zenawan and the 5 O's is four Glittering Wish main, three Song main, and one of the sideboard. So it's becoming like a very, very modern powered combo deck. Kills you the turn that you resolve the song creation. Very consistent at finding the song. Plays good cards, plays efficient cards. It's really impressive. Yeah, and even subtle stuff, right? Like Gutshot is a card you felt like maybe you had to play. Well, it's actually just a great card if a uh, certain monkey is going to be all over the place, right? You, I'm not mad at casting this card anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's the Strike at Rich. That's some te technology that we saw a while back, you know, ramps you to the song. Well, if you have to discard your hand, you have a, another way to restart the engine there. You know, we've seen screenshots of like someone losing on turn two. The opponent mulliganed to five. Turn one, they played a pact and countered it with Offer You Can't Refuse. And then turn two, they just went off with song. So it's a super impressive deck. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we talked about this one Offer You Can't Refuse was spoiled, right? It, we are like, well, it seems like maybe if you can find a way to abuse counting your own spell, we couldn't think of it at the time, right? We said, oh, right now, in you know, of course, we always think in terms of Ferris decks because that's what we like to play. It's like, ah, it's just not quite worth it. But that's why you go back in the lab and keep iterating because that's a lot of something, <laughs> right, for one mana. It's just, what do you do with that something? And if you're getting two cards for both the spell and the counter of the spell, it's, you know, it's way better than a ritual. It's one mana to make two mana and draw two cards. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. All right. Deck number five. Sticking with modern, we have, is it Bedlam Pyromancer? <laughs> this deck showed up in the five O's last week from the player Niklas and one class yeah. and one class. It's a, it's a control deck. It has Snapcaster Mage, Young Pyromancer, and Bedlam Reveler. That's the creature suite. Back that up with cards like Lightning Bolt, Opt, Seer, and Visions. You got yourself the making of a little Xerox strategy there. I mean, this package more or less makes sense, right? Spells matter. Young PZ and Snapcaster are supported by the same cantrips. In the process, you're filling your graveyard for the Bedlam Reveler, which will... When it enters the battlefield, discard your hand, draw three new cards. It's like a treasure cruise attached with three, four prowess body. I mean, that's an insanely powerful card. 
it almost reminds me of like the old Mardu Pyromancer decks, but instead of playing black cards and lingering souls, they're just like, all right, forget that. Let's just play some blue. Now, where this deck for me starts to like go a little bit off the rails is that it then complements that core of cantrips with counter magic. So there's two spell appears, four counter spell, four archmage's charm, and three fire ice. Looking at this list, and I know I I don't, I don't mean to uh, besmirch the reputation of uh, Nicholas here. <laughs> it looks like I'm looking at someone who like doesn't realize new cards exist. So like, when's the last <laughs> time you've seen a flame slash? Right, there's a new instant card that can do six damage for one mana, especially in a deck like this that fills its graveyard. Also, we don't see a lot of people playing Opt anymore. People play Consider, and the one reason you might want to play Consider is because you have cards like Snapcaster Mage and Bedlam Reveler. <laughs> now I know what people are moving towards Flame Slash because it does kill uh, Shredder on turn two, right? And and um, the card it's very rare to have Delirium on turn two, so you often can't kill Shredder with the other card. But that's literally it. I mean, it, it just seems wild to me some of these choices they're making. I know I know you're highlighting the Counterspell stuff, and it's because you've played so much Bedlam Revelerless, and so I know you've got a visceral reaction to that. I'm just responding to like. 2018 technology like <laughs> it's like the caveman lawyer woke up and was like you know what card is great flame slash that's <laughs> the card we've been missing yeah the encino metagame i mean this is like a special category of budget deck where like if you look at the price buying this deck would cost you 700 dollars. but if you're like a player who played modern up through like 2018 and you have a pretty robust modern collection minus the modern horizon sets this deck costs you very very little to buy now if you already have snapcasters and fetch lands you just like look at the current state of modern and are disgusted by having to buy all these furies and ragavans and whatever else like i don't want to buy all of that so let me just see what can i do with my snapcaster or my young pc my bedlam reveler <laughs> like okay if i just like have four archmage's charm i can like assemble some something that's like a plausible is it deck Right, and like Counterspell is a quote-unquote new card for Modern, but you probably already have it because it's, you know, it's in 7th edition and 8th edition and whatever, you know, whatever. Yeah. Ice Age. <laughs> All right, so what are the lessons from this deck? Well, two of them jump out to me. One is respect the classics, right? Young Pyromancer, Bedlam Reveler, these are classic cards. I think they, they have a special place in both your and my heart, David. We love these cards. But two... I think another lesson is any deck is capable of 5 0 on a good day, even a bad one. And I, I hate to say it, but I think this is a control deck from Nicholas is probably not built correctly. I, for me, the biggest thing is you cannot play Bedlam Reveler with counter magic, and you really shouldn't even play it with expensive spells. Like, I would never play Bedlam Reveler with counter spells and spell pierces, certainly not with Archmage's Charm. Right, like at a certain point, you'll draw a Bedlam Reveler, and you just like can't cast it until you've emptied out your hand. There's a reason we just don't see Bedlam Reveler played in blue decks like this. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a the the Merc Tide, you know, functionally has the same type of effect as Bedlam Reveler in the sense that it uses your graveyard as a resource and gives you an undercosted threat for what it is. Bedlam Reveler generates card advantage, and I think what we found in Fire Design is that card advantage actually comes pretty cheap now. There's a lot of ways to get those extra couple cards that Bedlam Reveler has. Uh, but Mark Tide kills your opponent in two attacks, so it functionally like ends the game very quickly. Uh, and eliminating all your opponent's future draw steps is much better than drawing three cards right now. <laughs> because each opponent's turn, they're probably drawing two cards you know, with the way modern design is. So uh, Mark Tide doesn't draw cards, but it, it eliminates draws from your opponents to not die. And so to me, it's like hidden card advantage. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I wouldn't play Sulfur Balls either. I don't think that's a card we need to be playing. I don't, I don't mean like, this is a cool list. I Yes, I love Bedlam Reveler. It's one of my pet cards. If there wasn't so much hate in Pioneer, I'd be playing Bedlam Reveler in a bunch of lists. Uh, but there's way better graveyard uses, so people are playing hate. But yeah, it's just like, there's just, there's just a lot of choices here that are pretty wild. Um, but yeah, maybe you're on the play for all five of your matches or something. I actually like Sulfur Falls. I don't know if that puts me in the minority, but it's a really great land. I mean, in modern... You're going to have fetch lands, so as soon as you get your first steam vents, Sulphur Falls becomes like the best land in your deck, assuming you're not vulnerable to Blood Moon or something like that. Yeah, you just don't, you don't see a lot of check lands, though. Like, Murktide does not play Sulphur Falls. Right, right. I mean, they're playing 
a little bit of a leaner land count, so you really can't afford to have a one land hand with a check land. And secondly, they want to play Fiery Islet. But as we've established, this player does not want to buy new cards. So right. <laughs> Which <laughs> I respect. No Fiery Islets in that deck. Awesome, awesome finish, though. And yeah, any deck that's playing four Snapcast or three Bedlam Relevant's like, yeah, I'm in for that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you're telling me this is a thing I can do, I will try to do it, but I suspect I will not be 5 0 that's also an anti-synergy. I mean, geez, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and you got to play Consider. I mean, that's not an expensive card. It's just Consider is <laughs> way better with Snapcaster and Bedlam Reveler. That's just, that's a fact. There's just no getting around that. All right. So that's deck number five. Deck number six. I'm going to turn over to David because I think you have a lot more experience with these cards than I do. Oh, man. I love this so much. So shout outs to Zaphod Beeblebrox. A uh, little Douglas Adams reference for people who are in the know. Jeskai Control. Uh, Dan has called it Can't Lose Control. This is a deck we've futzed around with a little bit in the past. So it takes advantage of the very unique text on Gideon of the Trials. Gideon of the Trials has a couple modes, but the third mode is you get an emblem with as long as you control a Gideon Planeswalker, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. And people have tried at various points to pair this with packs, which is which are cards that are under-costed, but they require you to sort of pay for them the following turn. If you don't pay, you lose the game. Well, if you never have the threat of losing the game, then Pact becomes an amazing card, right? That's just a free counterspell. Uh, Pact of the Titan makes a free 4-4 with... Uh, is it Haste? No, I think it's just a 4-4. Uh, this is pairing that with Angel's Grace, another card that prevents you from winning the game, or excuse me, prevents your opponents from winning the game and you from losing the game, with Snapcaster, which can buy back the Angel's Grace. Um... And yeah, other than that, it's just your normal suite of like selection cards, uh, some permission, expressive iteration because it's broken, a one of Murktide region because eventually you need to uh, win the game at the end of all this. And yeah, I I love it. I would love to see one of the take an extra turn and at the end of that turn lose the game because that's that's also a super sweet card, but they just couldn't fit it in here. They've got so much other sweet stuff going on. <laughs> So, like, what is the payoff for putting Gideon of the Trials and Angel's Grace into your deck, right? Like, these cards do almost nothing. I'm used to the payoff being exactly the card you mentioned, Chance for Glory, right? Take an extra turn, then lose the game. But here, without that extra turn, like, combo finish Ingo, like, the payoff is that I get to cast a free Counterspell and a free Pact of the Titan, possibly two of them if I have Snapcaster back the Pact of the Titan. That just hurts my brain a little i can't process it like is it just like a pact for value that is supported by this can't lose package of gideon plus angel's grace yeah basically i wonder if they've somehow also diagnosed that just gideon must be a reasonable car by itself because that's the only time when this starts to get attracted to me is if i don't i'm not embarrassed to just like play gideon on three mana you know plus it prevent damage from my opponent's ragavan let's say they don't have fury in hand again let's just imagine that world and uh, then on my following turn, I can kind of do my thing. Your line, though, that, that is sweet when you actually draw it. You packed on their EOT, Snapcaster packed. It only takes two mana. You have 10 power in play. And then Angel's Grace can't be countered. Um, so, you know, that's cool. So for me, like the lesson behind this deck, if, if there is a lesson, is that you got to unbox your thinking. And I'm for myself, at least... I think I got stuck on a rut where like, okay, if I'm playing Gideon and Angel's Grace, like I have to play Chance for Glory and it's just not worth doing that. And I, I've already concluded that I don't want to do that. So I've kind of <laughs> given up on this package. I, I don't think in a million years I would ever arrive at this list that's just like a control version of Pax and Gideons. So kudos to Zaphod Beeblebrox on the 5-0. Yeah, I mean, it's such a sweet list. And you just get people sometimes, right? Like, oh, I just attack and I just play my free pack. Block your Ragavan. My turn? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, deck number seven. Sticking with modern, we have a blue-white Urza list from Yusaz. Got a 5-0 last week. Blue-white Urza means Esper Sentinel. It means Ingenious Smith. It means Urza's. Ledger Shredder has become just like a multi-format star, and they're playing four copies here. So what's the innovation? Well, this player has concluded, by looking very carefully at what's in the lower right-hand corner of their cards, 
that all of those creatures I mentioned have one power, and that means that they're all compatible with Vesper Lurk. Vesper Lurk is like a mini Revelark from whatever set is from. First Modern Horizons. Okay, first Modern Horizons. <laughs> I got this wrong uh, for like half an hour on one of previous episodes, and now I'm like afraid to, to take a stand on which card is from which Modern Horizons set. In my mind, like if it's from a Horizon set and it's bad, it's MH1, and if it's good, it's MH2. And I believe that heuristic applies for Vesper Lark. Well, we're suggesting now that Vesper Lark is good and it's from MH1. Oh, man. <laughs> it's all falling apart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> 2 1 flying for 3. When Vesper Lark leaves the battlefield, you get to return target creature with power 1 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. It has evoke for 2. Cool little value creature that is also a pretty unique reanimation effect. It leads to some combos with. Stuff like Body Double um, and Elder of Dementia, you can do that. We had a whole Vesper Lark week. If people want to uh, dig it out of the archives, we had some sweet lists. Yeah. In the MH1 days. Exactly. So if you have a package of creatures that you already want to play that are all compatible with Vesper Lark, what happens if you just put four Vesper Lark into the deck? And that's what this player you says did. Now, you might want a little bit more graveyard stuff just to make Vesper Lark a little bit more exciting. So they've added three Emrys for that purpose, which is a card that Affinity has at different times actually used Emery unironically with no shenanigans. And Emery, again, is compatible with Vesper Lark. So now you're looking at 19 creatures that you already want to play in your artifact deck that all work with Vesper Lark. Yeah, Vesper Lark's super sweet tech. I don't love Emery or Ledger Shutter in these lists typically, but to the combination of them with Vesper Lark kind of like ties the whole room together, right? Like Emery is a card that Vesper Lark can get back, so you're more inclined to get value out of your Vesper Lark. It's also much more likely to like play Emery on turn two, Vesper Lark and Urza back if you happen to mill it on turn three. Like that's an insane start, right? Then Emery starts churning through Mishra's Bobbles or whatever. So the lessons here are twofold. One is you want to look for free homes. Free in the sense that I don't have to play any bad cards that I didn't want to play just to make my Vesper Lurks work, right? If I'm interested in Vesper Lark, I start with a shell that already has the pieces that work with Vesper Lark, and then I, I build from there. And the second lesson is use your graveyard very cautiously. Um, here we see four Vesper Lark and three Emery. Those are actually the only two cards in the list that are taking advantage of the graveyard. So that for me is like roughly the sweet spot of like, all right, I'm getting good value from the graveyard, but I'm also not vulnerable to graveyard hate, right? If they want to bring in Endurance or Rest in Peace or Hearse or whatever, like I can just completely ignore that and play through it for the most part. The only cards that shuts down are these seven cards, which are like decent on their own. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, Ledger Shutter, again, like you say, to be free, people play Ledger Shutter without any graveyard synergies, right? It's just a value 1-3 drop. It makes your Emery's better. So all these cards are on top of each other. Like, Ledger Shutter is an extra card that sends stuff to the graveyard that can get you value out of your Emery. Ledger Shutter works great with Mishra's Bobble because it gets an extra trigger the turn you play Bobble. Bobble makes you want to play Emery. Ledger Shutter loots, which makes you want to play Vesper Lark. Ledger Shredder has one power, Vesper Lark can get it back. Uh, like all these car all these little things add up to like your deck just is so smooth and creamy. Cause the first thing I saw is this doesn't have any of the bombs that I like to play, right? Like mm -hmm. I want to play the affinity cards at the one blue mana two two draw two. I want to play one blue mana sorcery draw two. They're only playing two nettle cysts. You're not getting that much payoffs, but everything else is just this sweet synergy. All these cards, every little interaction makes them a little bit better with each other. Yeah. Now is it worth it? I mean, you are giving up stuff exactly like David said. You're giving up Thought Monitors. You're giving up Stoneforge Mystic if you like that. I don't have an answer for that, but just as a, as a lesson in brewing, I think this is a nice job by you says here on putting this list together. It's also like when this deck does well, you just feel so much smarter. Like that matters a lot to me. <laughs> like the mono blue, just super power, right? Your, your mana is obvious. All the cards that should go in the deck are obvious. This list is like, oh man, look at how cute every interaction I do. Like, oh, and this does that, and then this does that. And like, you have all these decision points. So yeah, that, I mean, come on. We're playing this game for many reasons. <laughs> and uh, is it USA, is, or is it USAZ? Uh, whoever they are understands what, what it's all about. They understand what really counts. <laughs> exactly. All right, deck number eight. 
Boros Kirin Conjurant. David, tell us about this list. Yeah, so this deck is exploiting a combo that I proposed a long time ago, and I, I it was one of our le least uh, better performing lists, which is the interaction of Celestial Kirin, a card from way back in Kamigawa block, two white-white, three-three legendary creature, Kirin Spirit, flying. Whenever you play a spirit or arcane spell, destroy all permanents with that spell's converted mana cost. And it combos with uh, Ugin's Conjurant, which is a spirit monk creature with casting cost X. So the thought process there is, if you resolve Celestial Kirin, you can cast Ugin's Conjurant for zero, and you get an Armageddon, which is, as we pointed out way back when, not legal in the format. How good would Armageddon <laughs> even be? Of course, that prompted a, a whole discussion from Damon, explaining how <laughs> Armageddon wouldn't even be good in modern. We shouldn't uh, be building a, a deck to go around it. Aspiring Spike has taken that concept, which people have kicked around. You know, I think our list was white green to take advantage of the the white green tutor. Mm -hmm. um, we were also playing Ranger Captain of EOS. So I think that that inclusion is pretty obvious. He combined it with sort of the boom bust, uh, indestructible land combo, or I don't know if you want to call it combo synergy, and then built a, re a really cool list, right? Uh, using Esper Sentinel as another cool uh, hit for your Ranger Captain, playing for Ragavan, which actually functions as a ramp spell at times. Um, and then the Fury, Solitude, Ephemerate. Uh, Ephemerate has value with Ranger Captain, and obviously Ephemerate, uh, Fury, and Solitude. You know, you, you can play to the board very easily, and you can have a creature that can dominate the board so that you're... The main thing, right, when you Armageddon is you want to be ahead on board. Blowing up all the lands isn't good if your opponent has a 4-4 and you have a 3-3 flyer. They're just going to win the race. But Solitude and Fury kind of fix that problem, either allowing you to do a bunch of stuff um, if both lands are destroyed or to put you way ahead on board for the Armageddon to be good. And then Armageddon is not that damaging. This deck, we have four Flagstones, three Darksteel Citadel, and then four of the uh, white, red, indestructible artifact land, uh, Rustvale Bridge. So the early boom bust plan is great. Boom busting after Armageddoning. Maybe they just have one more land. You get to kill that too. So super cool list. Uh, I watched Spike play a little bit of this uh, and was kind of impressed by the deck. It, it has a lot of synergies. Yeah, Armageddon gets a lot more attractive when you're playing four flagstones and seven indestructible lands. So lessons from this deck. One is don't be afraid to revisit old packages, right? The Kirin... Ranger Captain, Ugin's Conjurant, that's been around forever, you know, with Flagstones. You know, gradually the pieces have, been, have come over the years, Cleansing Wildfire and then the Rustvale Bridge. Packages like this that, you know, flamed out the first few times we tried to, we tried to make <laughs> them happen. Like, you know, there's still a chance for them. But that leads into the second lesson, which is the more important one, which is that you have to play good cards even if your goal is to play bad cards or synergy cards like <laughs> Celestial Kirin. <laughs> These are bad cards, right? You're, you're never going to be happy to draw an Ugin's Conjurant or a Celestial Kirin in Modern. If you want to do that, you have to. You have to stay disciplined and at least let the rest of your deck play good cards. That is to say, MH2 cards. So we have the Ragavans, the Esper Sentinels, the Solitudes and Furies. And I mean, this is Aspiring Spike is like the master at this, right? Through like Aspiring Spike and you will have much better results. Pick your cute synergy thing and then surround it with good cards. And Rustville Bridge is new tech, right? It's a fixing land that also uh, makes your Armageddon better. Yes, exactly. And this is this is our uh, knucklehead theory, right? The, uh, the uh, Pat Riley architect of the LA Lakers, New York Knicks, and Miami Heat. You only want like one knucklehead on the team. You can always get away with one knucklehead. That's the <laughs> cute synergy that you're doing. That's what Dan's describing. You don't want to combine that with a bunch of other knuckleheads because then they go out to the club together and, you know, they start marrying Carmen Electra or whatever. You want everybody else to be, you know, eating brown rice and drinking water and, you know, on the TB12 doing yoga. But the one guy, you know, he doesn't have anyone else to go out to the club with. He might just hang out with them a little bit. Like, yeah. <laughs> Spend a weekend in, you know, start reading uh, some self-help books from Oprah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Two more decks to go. The next one comes to us from Anthony Menino, who is I Play Bad Decks, friend of the show, Crabvine Specialist, and we've, we've had him on to talk about that deck in the past. He did well with Crabvine in the challenge a couple of weeks back, but, you know, that's not his main jam. His main jam is brewing with crazy and sometimes bad decks. And he's got another spicy one for us here. It is Kethis Combo in Modern. 
Kethis the Hidden Hand. White, black, green for a 3-4 legendary elf advisor. It has two effects. One is that your legendary spells cost one generic less to cast, but the second effect that makes Kethis a combo engine says that you can exile two legendary cards from your graveyard. When you do this, until end of turn, all your other legendary cards in your graveyard can be cast directly from the graveyard. So they, they have like free escape as long as you exile two legendary cards once to Kethis. The way that you combo with this is, well, A, you've got to like fill up your graveyard with stuff. And in Pioneer, for a while, you would do this with, what is that card? Diligent Excavator? Diligent Excavator. One and a blue, one, three. Whenever you play a historic card, uh, target player mills two. Exactly. So you're continuing to fill up your own graveyard with stuff, a lot of which has to be legendary, so you can keep activating Kethys because every time you activate Kethys, it only applies to the cards that are currently in your graveyard. You have to keep activating it multiple times throughout the turn in order to give the new stuff that you milled the ability to be free cast back from the graveyard. So this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be milling yourself. Your mana is going to come from Mox Amber, which is a legendary Mox that's convenient for Kethys. Going to have to keep recasting those to generate mana because they're legendary. They put themselves back in the graveyard. It's very cute. The mana you're getting off that will eventually fuel, you know, whatever you're winning the game with, which is probably Thassa's Oracle. Although, because Kethys lets, lets you recast legendaries, you can actually recast Jace, Wielder of Mysteries, directly from your graveyard because he is a legendary planeswalker. Now, if you take that core, bring it to modern, Anthony has identified that, okay, Grinding Station is much better than Diligent Excavator for this purpose. Underworld Breach, you know, Grinding Breach, the Jiggy Wiggy special, has already used that package successfully, and that can support the Kethys shell as well. Um, so that's what he's done. He's got the Grinding Station, Mox Amber, Underworld Breach core with uh, Chromatic Stars and Mishra's Baubles cards you might expect, uh, and surrounded that with a Kethys package uh, of legendaries. Emery is another important card for this shell because Emery can be recast for just one blue over and over again, putting itself back in the graveyard when you cast your new copy of Emery. Um, so even if you don't have the grinding station, just Emery plus Mox Amber plus Kethys will allow you to mill yourself out even if you've never found the station, uh, which is very cool. Yeah, and Kethys is banned in Pioneer. Uh, it had a brief run in Standard where it was one of the better decks. And I think it was sort of preemptively banned because the card is not a deterministic win it's very hard to figure out if you're dead or not so you kind of have to watch your opponent like fumble around with all right was this legend in my graveyard when i activated the <laughs> got this ability and uh <laughs> yeah yeah tds deck to keep track of um probably for the best so that's banned in pioneer i know david this is on your list of cards that could be unbanned in pioneer safely oh yeah definitely safely but it's annoying. I don't yes. think anyone necessarily misses it. Yeah, no, we're not missing anything. Yeah. So what is the lesson, the takeaway from this deck? Well, one is that a card that is banned in other formats is probably worth a closer look in the formats in which it is still legal. And I know that sometimes I propose this from standard to modern, and it's like, okay, caved in enough already. <laughs> like, <laughs> stop trying to get us to play faceless haven and modern or whatever the case may be but for some cards you're going from a, a card banned in pioneer and looking at what can it do in modern is not that crazy um so i think that a card like kethis what's the modern version of that combo going to look like it's going to be more powerful it's going to be more consistent and i think anthony has correctly identified that and got rewarded for it yeah, the fact that it's additive, too. You still get to play the full under breach combo deck, right? You're having to sacrifice maybe playing some Teferis and a few other things that the Jiggy Wiggy special would play. But you get to basically port that entire deck, which we know is functional and very good in certain metagames. You just add a few extra cards, and now you've... The Rule of Eight, right, is very live. Um, and we've seen the Rule of Eight from the Rule of Four as a huge upgrade. So what you're lacking maybe in some individually powerful cards is your primary synergy is now doubling up, right? It, so that was the big recognition is underworld breach grinding station that's a deck mm -hmm. kethis just requires you to add a few cards they're only playing a few speculative extra cards in here that you wouldn't play in just your normal underworld grinding breach deck and your reward for that is you have basically double the number of underworld breaches uh that's pretty sweet right exactly it's almost like a complete mashup of two different decks breach station is one combo kethis amber and emery is another combo they just both happen to win with thassa's oracle or jace and right. they both use Mox Amber. The second lesson is that the small edges do matter. And one of the ways that you get your legendary count up to the critical density is that you have to play legendary lands. 
So you'll see like the modern build will be playing all the random lands like Manamo School at Water's Edge. But now that we have the new lands from Neon Dynasty, that is to say we have Boseju, we have the new Iganjo, we have Otawara. I mean, these are good cards that have become staples of the format. Now you have in your mana base like five new lands that are like staples of modern or well, four i guess he's not playing the red one and your mana is like a little more consistent you're not ever at risk of doubling up on drawing the same legendary land twice so the small edges like that do matter yeah and then the mana base is crazy stable because you have spire of industry and mana confluence and glimmer void so your lands are either like super value lands or when they're in their graveyard they have value or your lands are all you know rainbow yeah, exactly. All right, last deck, our 10th deck. We're going back to Pioneer here, so I'm going to turn it over to you, David. I have played and lost to this person, so maybe I was in this 5-0. We don't know. <laughs> I won't. I have, I'm have. i 0-3 against this deck. I was actually going to bring it up <laughs> the next time. I was like, I don't know if this deck is good, but it smokes all the garbage decks I'm running. Cute Chandra19, awesome username. <laughs> Chandra is cute. I like that. Uh, they are playing... Hammer time in Pioneer. So, four Colossus Hammer, that's the highlighted class, uh, with four Cigar Aid. So, you don't have Pure Steel Paladin. How do we make sure we get our Cigar Aid then? Four Moon Blessed Cleric. Moon Blessed Cleric finds Cigar Aid. Once you have Cigar Aid, though, what do your Moon Blessed Clerics find? They find Fighter Class. Fighter Class allows you to tutor up a specific equipment. So, you have Moon Blessed Cleric lets you find the equipment itself with fighter class or the cigar is age super cool technology the creature suite uh you know i have no comment on that <laughs> there's a bunch of garbage creatures in here <laughs> i have died to swift blade vindicator many times there's this 50 list has four fervent champion four healers hawk four rabbit battery uh and then the other key tutorable uh thing to look for is shadow spear right you're Creature does not have flying, does not have evasion, unless it's specifically a swift blade vindicator. Got to give a trample, and then lifelink means you can't race. Um, it is a Gigantha deck. I've lost a Gigantha out of this list many times. And then they're playing four Eater of Virtue, which is just the next best uh, equipment, I think. Uh, I don't know that it's particularly uh, good, although if it dies on swift blade vindicator, then granting those abilities might matter. It's worth noting when I've lost to them, I've never seen them play Eater Virtue. So maybe this is the new technology that Cute Chandra found that kind of took the deck up to the next level because uh, it seemed very clunky if you uh, were able to get rid of their one of Shadow Spear. And Eater Virtue plus Swift Blade Vindicator is maybe maybe the key. Yeah, that surprised me even more than seeing the Colossus Hammer package in Pioneer was four copies of Eater of Virtue. Eater of Virtue is a bone splitter, but it's legendary. One to cast, one to equip, plus two plus O to your creature. But then it also accumulates keywords. So over time, you know, your first creature equipped with Eater of Virtue dies, but now the Eater has acquired lifelink and haste or who knows what else. So in theory, you know, it becomes more and more powerful as, as the game goes on. Does that ever happen in practice? I'm not sure, but just seeing four of them here and looking at the creature suite, I mean, it feels like these creatures were carefully chosen for their keywords. You have Fervent Champion, that's First Strike Haste. Healer's Hawk, Lifelink and Flying. Rapid Battery has Haste. Swift Blade Vindicator, Double Strike, Vigilance, Trample. There's even All State of Life's Bounty here as Protection and Lifelink. So I, I do feel like Eater of Virtue can be an important plan B for the deck. So rules question, Dan. If I have an Eater of Virtue that has gained the ability to grant flying, let's say I had to uh, shock their Healer's Hawk, and I have a creature equipped with Colossus's hammer, and then I equip this Eater of Virtue, that creature now has flying, correct? Uh, okay. I, yeah, I believe so. So yeah, when I when I played, and I, like I said, I played Cute Chandra three times, I believe, uh, and have never beat them. <laughs> They were playing a multiple all state of life's bounty, and I never saw Healer's Hawk uh, or Rabbit Battery or Eater of Virtue. So I think this is, to your point, something that the this person has iterated towards as they've mucked around the leagues. Uh, they were playing four Adanto Vanguard main very, very commonly. So I think this is maybe the leanest package to really maximize your ability to actually combo kill. And so, you know, just beating the crap out of me slowly allows you to iterate your deck to uh, perfection, <laughs> I think. 
exactly. So lessons to draw from this deck. Well, there's a bunch of potential lessons, but one of them, I think, is that you need to bring a second backup plan. Bring a plan B. We could get fixated on this idea, oh, Colossus Hammer and Pioneer, but then we might miss the fact that, okay, you can stop Colossus Hammer and Pioneer. It's, it's you know, just fatal push and you're fine. What do you do then? I think this either a virtue plan is that plan B, at least in this configuration, and I'm just uh, really tickled to see it here in the five O's. Second lesson is weak or unplayable cards, draft chaff cards, Moonblast Cleric, Healer's Hawk, Rabbit Battery. Even though these cards are weak, they can still be the best in class cards and the perfect card for your strategy. Like once you've identified what your deck is trying to do, there's no better card than these. Uh, for those roles, right? Moonblast Cleric. I mean, it's it's the perfect card here. It gets Sigarda's Aid, gets the Fighter Class, the Fighter Class gets your equipment, or it even gets a Rabbit Battery if you like need another creature. So you start to see like uh, they're all like connected to each other here. And if you just like ignore these cards, like I mean, who even keeps Healers, Hawks, and Fervent Champions in their playables box, right? But these cards have unique skills, and we shouldn't forget about them. We should like be actively looking for ways to put them together. Also, don't adopt this. I just don't want to keep getting smoked by random people copying cute Chandra and the Qs. I, I can't take it. <laughs> Let me get a win, people. What the hell? <laughs> exactly. All right. So that is a look at some of the new tech from this week. 10 decks and a few more than 10 lessons. We double dipped a little bit there. I don't know, 20 lessons? You got a few bonus lessons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For summer school. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we hope this was enlightening or at least entertaining in some in some ways and hey maybe there's some new tech for you to try as we're in the summer doldrums absolutely so that being said uh we are going to turn our attention back to brewing up some lists of our own that's going to come up in our monday show uh we'll be hearing from david on some of the stuff he's been working on so check back in then we're going to take a look at some grixis lists and uh, actually some returning favorites I saw a humble defector in one of the screenshots you sent me this week. So I'm oh, yeah. excited to hear more it's about go that. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so check back in in just a couple days for more of that, and we'll see you next time. All right, take care, sir. Deck lists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in on Monday for Maestro's Week. Plus, a look at Humble Defector, Sidisi Brood Tyrant, Riel the Everwise, and more. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.